50 years ago, the world was in the grips of the Cold War. The Russians and the Americans had nuclear arsenals that could destroy modern civilization in an afternoon. A group of nerds in the Western world read the sci-fi book The Foundation, about a futuristic galaxy where a genius realizes that civilization's about to collapse, and so creates a colony of scientists to rebuild civilization to deal with that. Over centuries, its colony succeeds and rebuilds civilization. Upon reading this book, these nerds, with the support of the U.S. military, started creating connections between different universities in case there was a nuclear war to rebuild civilization. Little did they know that this technology, which allowed instantaneous communication of information around the world, would result in one of the greatest technological innovations in the history of mankind. One capable of destroying empires, founding religions, wrecking societies, and changing the world beyond anyone's imagination. That was the internet. The internet has totally changed our lives, altering the world in ways beyond most people's comprehension. However, the internet as a force in society is only really 30 years old, but with something as big as the internet, it will continue to change the world. This is a video of my predictions on how the rise of the internet will fundamentally change the course of the history of the future. The results will astound you on how such a mundane thing as computers connected to each other will reap a harvest beyond anyone's imagination. I mean, the fact that you're seeing this video online should be an indicator of how much the internet really has changed our lives. Let's get started. Hi everybody, I'm Rudyard, the guy behind What If All Tist, and I'm here to bring you a message. The internet has become the primary engine of social posturing today's world, with people looking for new ways to show off online. And because of that, it's no surprise established titles became so popular. Established titles is a company that will sell you a lordship in Scotland. No, I'm not joking. You can become an actual lord holding a title and land in Scotland that you can brag about at a party. It also makes a great gift for friends and family. I love that I can tell people I'm Lord Rudyard Lynch or Lord What If Altist, which sounds pretentious, but I guess that's the point. And this title makes for just excellent bragging rights, and it comes with an actual piece of land in Scotland. And you can put this on plane tickets, credit cards, dating profiles, or business cards. And yes, this title is legit. You can even purchase them in pairs, getting one for Lord and Lady, which is a really romantic gift to get. And for every title you buy, they help plant a tree in Scotland. So you're simultaneously giving yourself a landed title while helping Scotland's natural environment. This makes established titles a great gift, and they're running a massive sale with a giant Labor Day sale. Plus, if you use the promo code WHATIFALTHIST, you can get an additional 10% off. Go to EstablishedTitles.com slash WHATIFALTHIST now to support the channel and get an awesome gift. The internet permeates every aspect of our lives. Think of it this way. We order food through the internet, date through the internet, have pleasure and pleasure ourselves through the internet, get news through the internet, often work, travel, or learn. Everything that we can put through the internet, we have. I mean, hell, even communities of people who want to destroy modern technology and return to a primitive society without the internet have internet communities to talk about that. And because the internet's only been around for 25 years, this means the internet over time, and probably centuries, will affect every element of our societies. Thus, I'm dividing this video between different sections showing how the internet will affect different parts of our civilization, whether religion, social class, the economy, war, etc. We will move through the most mundane to the biggest, gradually showing the effect the internet will have upon our entire civilization. The internet has resulted in some ways the best and the worst of times. I think our descendants and future generations will in many ways view this current era of history as spectacular and romanticize its dramas since it contains a dynamism that comes from this extreme. On the positive side, the internet allows massive ease. Think of how insane it is that with a press of a button, someone can deliver food to your house of nearly any kind of cuisine you'd like normally within an hour. Amazon is in many ways technological wizardry in that they deliver practically anything extremely quickly to almost any area of the developed world. The internet allows rapid communication and thus people to meet and talk in ways that would have been impossible beforehand. To just put a little bit of perspective on this, think of all the bizarre crazes that can only exist with the internet. 
how for a brief second you can have the whole Western world and beyond think of the Amber Heard trial and then immediately get bored by that and then focus upon some other thing like a funny viral video, a political scandal, a new popular movie, and the list could go on endlessly. It's easy to forget that in the 18th century it would take four months for information to travel from London to New York just across the Atlantic. Now it's almost as if the whole world is a single village where we can gossip instantaneously. However, this brings up the negative sides of the internet, of which there are a couple. The reason I say that future generations will romanticize our times is that we will be both remembered for the pain our era has, and at the same time the early excesses of the internet age that we do not understand to be excesses yet. I think a good example of how the internet's affecting society is how brutal and yet spectacular industrialization was. One side you saw massive gains in that humans could produce so much more than they ever had thought possible before. Cities could rise rapidly out of small villages because that's where the industry was, and Europe's armies could now destroy the most powerful empires of the non-industrial world instantaneously with no casualties. However, at the same time, industrialism was unbelievably brutal for those who actually had to live through it. You had factory workers who would work 16-hour days, people living in horrible slums of starvation wages, mental health was at some of the worst levels in all of history. There was a reason communism was as popular as it was. It's because the life of the working classes were intolerably painful during industrialization. A big reason for that was that there just weren't the social norms that existed before to deal with the massive changes in social relations that came with industrialization. Beforehand, people lived in rural villages, worked the land that was under some kind of feudal landlord, and worshipped their old religions. However, once the norm became a wage worker in a big city, of course things didn't work out perfectly since there wasn't a precedent on how to do it properly, and so people automatically got the worst possible result. I think an important lesson is that whenever you have chaos, the unscrupulous will use it to abuse other people, and during industrialization, factory owners could abuse their workers because there wasn't a precedent on what to do right. People normally view their era of history as a high point of history, and the preceding eras of history as savage and worse, leading up to, of course, our era being the best. It's funny that every era believes that, though, and it's very interesting to see eras of history that we view as depressing and much worse than our era thought this as well. The Victorians, who we normally view as an era of prudery, poverty, and slave labor conditions, totally viewed themselves as the end point of centuries of progress, and their condition is much better than their ancestors. The Middle Ages that we view as a cesspool of barbarism, ignorance, and filth even called themselves the modern world, and they viewed the Catholic Church as an institution of social progress that was gradually leading the world towards godliness. We see the same factors today, with a good example being the implicit assumption in social justice in which we have the moral superiority and so have the right to tear down statues of historical figures without understanding that in the same way they could be wrong and make mistakes, we're going to do the same thing. Likewise, the condescending attitude with which we often treat the past. However, whenever people behave in cruel and bad ways, you know psychologically it's coming from a fundamental insecurity. And in our treatment of the past, that insecurity is our stress at our own times, and especially how quickly the internet has changed them. In other words, we feel the need to denigrate and make the past look worse to make our current lives look tolerable. The biggest pain of the modern world is loneliness. Modern society is unbearably lonely for most young people. This is a function of two different things. Partially, it's the social competition that comes from macroeconomic conditions like globalization and population growth that I've talked about in these videos, and that means people work more and have less time for social relationships, yet at the same time, it's also the convenience of the internet, which allows less space for real human relationships, because when you get down to it, human relationships aren't convenient. Let's look at it this way. It's very normal for a person today to work online, have pleasure online by watching Netflix or scrolling through Instagram, and have that be their whole lives, with no friends, love, or daily interpersonal relations. Compare this to the conditions that humans evolved for, in which we live in villages, and have intimate human connections from people we knew all the time. Humans have evolved to be social, and loneliness is as deadly for shortening lifespans as is smoking a pack of cigarettes every day from studies. Our psychologies evolved for the last ice age, and back then if you didn't have a tribe, you'd starve and die when a tiger tried to eat you. Thus, when people don't have strong social communities, they start to feel depressed and scared, which is what's happening now. How many of you know your neighbors? How many of you would know how to meet your new best friend? Or if you wanted to meet a new romantic partner that you'd marry, how you'd go about doing it? Or find a church filled with cool people who get you? These are problems literally all young people face today. It's shocking when I meet elite young people, or successful and charismatic young folks like celebrities, CEOs, or political linchpins, and how they still struggle with this. 
I've even met professional socialites who still feel lonely on a regular basis, and these are people whose job it is to socialize. For me myself, I feel simultaneously overwhelmed with the amount of socializing I do just online, but because there's so much of it, well, I feel lonely since it's very hard to have real connections with someone in the same physical space. Sadly, stuff like this tends to feed back upon itself, thus resulting in negative cycles that just make things worse and worse. It always shocks me how, for lack of a better term, most people are so scared and group-like. And it also really shocks me that social anxiety is the dominant force in the world in a lot of cases, and more people are scared of public speaking than are scared of death. Well, my biggest fears are being eaten by a crocodile, marrying a horrible wife, or being killed by a totalitarian state. Let's say if both you and your neighbor realize you're lonely and don't like that you have no community, or you see a cute girl walk down the street and both of you want a romantic partner and don't have good options. However, if you were to knock on that neighbor's door in much of the modern world and ask them if they'd like to come over and have drinks at your place, or start chatting with that girl, they would immediately condemn you as desperate or a weirdo, even if they secretly, desperately desire that connection. To accept those invitations would require that those people admit their own inherent loneliness, which is too painful for the vast majority of people. We tend to downplay this loneliness as a society since to deal with it would be too painful. Artisans likely think we lived miserable lives due to this loneliness in the same way we think the Victorians lived miserable lives for being so stuck up, even if in both cases that's an oversimplification and not totally true. A theme we will see going forward is how our society will overreact to the sense of loneliness as a culture in the next generation. Something I've been thinking about is that humans are inherently creatures of ease, and that in almost all cases, humans will do what is the easiest option. When people have problems, they will more often turn to the bottle than therapy, given one of those options forces them to think. The reason social media was able to take over society to the degree it has been is that the apps were designed in Silicon Valley to be addictive, so we don't have to think about them. They're designed to go through our mental filters so that we spend all our time on Netflix or Instagram, and then we look up at the clock on our screen to see that four hours have passed without a thought passing. In many ways, my generation, Gen Z, or those born since 1995, have been screwed since we've been shoved into a giant social experience of trying to put all of our lives into social media. Our set has been addicted to social media, on average spending what amounts to every moment we're not working on screens. And this has had profoundly negative effects upon my group. The addiction to screens, and I must say this again, but these technologies have been explicitly designed to be what amounts to addictive, means young people socialize less, have less life experiences at all, and the like, sucking the lives out of them in the same way that addicts spend all their time with their substance rather than in the real world. This is a generation divided between those who choose to rise to greatness and those who spend their lives sucked out of them due to the misfortunes of the turning of the wheel of history. To see what direction that wheel turns, we'll look at in the next section. I consider the rise of the internet to be in many ways similar to the printing press. With the printing press, the spread of information became much more rapid. Beforehand, you had to write everything by hand, and afterwards you could instantly print thousands of copies. You would think this would be universally positive, however, it then resulted in 150 years of savage religious wars that tore the continent of Europe up. Peasant rebellions tore across Germany as people challenged social assumptions that had existed for centuries. In many ways, I believe this is similar to the political crises we're facing right now. The thing about dissemination of information is that it allows people with similar agendas to congregate. This strangely allows political radicals to meet up and organize much more easily. In Luther's day, with the printing press in the 16th century, it was that people could spread the Bible more easily, and thus people realized the inconsistencies between the Bible and how the Catholic Church acted, thus resulting in the mass spread of Protestantism across Northern Europe. We see this day with further political radicalization. Back in the day, people watched the same centrist news channels, which kept politics within similar discourses, and the population's idea of what was appropriate political discourse within a certain range or Overton window. This is like how the Catholic Church's doctrines were viewed in the medieval world. However, today, political radicals only read the news that they want to read from their perspectives. And since these radicals congregate, they create a cascading effect in which their radicalism just keeps being reinforced by other radicals. Examples of this within recent history are the rise of the alt-right and social justice. In both cases, these are groups where the dominant mainstream parties would like to go away, yet Due to the internet allowing radicals to congregate, they've been taking over the traditional party systems and seizing greater and greater controls over society. This is similar to how both Protestant and Catholic radicals seized control of their faiths in the Reformation.
I think a good non-political example of how the internet can affect politics that's demonstrative of the underlying trends is Disney, and its relation to its own fans. Disney and the intellectual properties Disney owns, like Marvel and Star Wars, have very loud and energetic fan communities. What's happened is that Disney tailors more and more of its actual content around what these digital fan communities want and their expectations. This fits with fan conspiracy theories about movies, various bizarre social justice prescriptions, and stuff like that. Although Disney is really still in charge, they let themselves be dominated by the crowds, changing their movies so as not to get the ire of a digital crowd that might lower their revenue. Ironically, this is basically the exact same process as how political parties have been humbled with internet radical movement. Donald Trump is the best example of this, as a politician using political clout and crowd chasing to get power. In the whole rest of this channel, I talk about the future of politics, and I think for a bunch of reasons we're going to enter a period of massive political and social turmoil as our current world system ends. In conflicts like this, the ideological armies will be formed and radicalized through the internet, which allows very easy group formation under special interests. At the same time, the psychological problems of people being lonely, horny, and depressed caused by the internet will create large crowds that in turn are easy to radicalize through the internet for events like revolutions. The biggest effect of the internet will be to make society more democratic. In the previous system, those who controlled the means of communication like the television networks and the publishing houses held immense power. However, today, people hear what they want to hear, not what the authorities want. And I mean, I don't... That last note is a perfect introduction to the next section, or that it will make society less top-down and more populist. This will have profound effects in the economy, among many other things. One example of this being that since people can work remotely, people will leave the often overpopulated and insanely expensive global cities to live in more pleasant rural places. I mean, just to use myself as an example, I work remotely and manage my team remotely, and I've decided to move from New York back to Philadelphia, where I grew up. Since Philadelphia is so much cheaper, calmer, and I have family there. I know many, many people who are leaving big cities for the same reasons. If you're in the real estate markets, I would invest in areas with pleasant backgrounds but are rural and relatively cheap. Areas like this are normally college towns or tourist areas, and so invest in real estate in places like the Grand Tetons in Wyoming, Niagara Falls, the Blue Ridge Mountains, the Florida Beach, or rural France and Italy. People can work remotely from cheaper and more pleasant places. Across history, we've seen waxing and waning cycles of urbanization and ruralization. This will probably be an era of ruralization like the early Middle Ages. It wouldn't surprise me if this change goes on for centuries, for starting now. If political turmoil makes worse, it will in turn make rural areas, especially ones where people are close to food, look more appealing. This would also be a handy way of fixing the birth rate problem, since rural populations are normally replaceable, while urban populations have never been able to have stable birth rates across the whole history of man. Thus, the political crisis will in turn make people move into the countryside, and as I talk about in other episodes, this political crisis will be caused by population collapse, and thus, this political crisis will mean people will move to the countryside and have kids, which will fix the problem. Speaking of medieval economics, the effect of the gig economy, in which more and more people are employed, will likely create self-employment conditions where people, say, make their own bread, and then they sell it via new bread Uber to clients. You have to keep in mind that companies run big costs through administration, and so if digital services make it easy to communicate through smaller, more organic organizations that will outcompete the larger, more top-down ones, it would result in it being more economically feasible, which is, again, pretty economically similar to the change that went between the classical to the medieval world, where you went from these big slave estates to small peasant farmlands. People also hate working in big corporations, which feel soulless and meaningless, and so if given the choice between being self-employed in the gig economy, and working in a big company, almost all folks will pick self-employment, thus further promulgating this economic trend. Another thing to keep in mind is that the low wages we associate with the gig economy are more a function of how we have way too much labor for a healthy economy, rather than a gig economy itself, which could supply good-paying jobs. One of the big things of big corporations is that they provide a degree of welfare and stability for society given just how fucking big they are. If you're sick for a month, your corporation in America legally has to pay insurance costs and can't fire you. Meanwhile, if we were in a predominantly gig-based economy, that's not the case. Thus, we'd probably end up seeing some form of welfare of a universal basic income type be put in place in most countries as a form of basic welfare if we move to a predominantly gig-based economy just to give people a psychology of security that the voting public wants. Wherever you see some group using a monopoly on information for wealth and power, the internet will rip it up going forward. One example being the universities. 
The universities have grown ludicrously wealthy by basically gatekeeping wealth and elite status. Colleges in America charge truly ludicrous amounts for attendance, and in the top 20 universities in America, 60% of their students come from the top 1% of families, and so in many ways have become vehicles of class warfare. Likewise, universities have used their monopoly to push what amounts to rabid leftist ideological propaganda that the vast majority of the population doesn't agree with. The massive failures and collapse in the world system that we will likely see soon will be probably blamed upon the college-educated technocracy. The trend I could possibly see is what amounts to another reformation inside Western civilization between Europe and North America since the conditions are so similar to the last reformation. As I've said before, the modern left has become the tool of the technocracy, pushing policies that benefit the college educated, meanwhile the right protects other business, religious, and military interests. I don't think that the technocracy will survive in the fundamentally capitalist America, which hates bureaucracy, but I could see, and I'm not really sure about this, it continuing to dominate Europe where the technocracy is more entrenched. We're already seeing universities lose their power where people are going to college a lot less and less people trust anything the universities say. Growing up, it's been strange to see how I know less and less people who want to go to college at all. I was shocked when I heard my 15-year-old cousin, coming from a middle-class family, was competing to get into a selective vocational school, since more and more parents are distrusting the whole college track, since, at least in America, you'll make more money as a plumber than most lawyers. The traditional media is another institution that no one trusts and is collapsing to be replaced by newer forms of media. I once saw someone say that an empty video stream by YouTube journalist Tim Poole or Ben Shapiro's Daily Wire in general got more views than CNN or MSNBC, which I had to double check and it wasn't true. But the way the world works is that the fact I had to double check that means that the growth of the internet will result in that being true in a couple years. The networks throw out the clickbait they do since they're so desperate to compete in a world with free internet news. Fundamentally, I think this competition between digital and traditional media will be good, and once we're over with our current crisis, we'll make both become higher quality and of better journalism. What I'd guess is that half of the traditional networks go bankrupt, the other half get new leadership who forces them to regain their journalistic integrity and honor. Meanwhile, you'll see guys like Ben Shapiro, The Young Turks, or Tim Pool morph into being news networks in their own right. I said to a friend that the internet will be one of the best things in the history of the human race, since by its nature, people will always look for quality quality, and you don't really need big production values on the internet. On YouTube, when big networks try to make YouTube channels, they can't get the details and passion right in the same way normal people who make channels they care about do, and the viewers can tell it's phony, and those viewers in turn go for more genuine content. The internet will always filter out quality in the same way wars have made nations stronger or capitalism makes society wealthier. In the long term, I'm very bullish on the internet, and I think it will create countless high-quality individuals who will change history over time. I think the internet naturally selects for future political leaders, philosophers, or celebrities of all kinds, since the internet selects for charisma, which is important for all forms of communication. I liken the internet to the Eurasian steppe to that friend, saying the constant competition of the Eurasian steppes always created barbarians who were able to conquer the civilized peoples, well, those civilized peoples in turn became soft due to ease, much like the bureaucratic and corporate organizations such as Hollywood, big government, or traditional record labels and music who are forced to compete against whatever genius 15-year-old shows up on the internet. And this will be true for a very long time. The final thing we have to cover with the internet and the economy working together, and something that comes with decentralization, is crypto, of course. I said this before in a previous video, but I'll say it again, in that my father once said, fiat currencies are bullshit backed by aircraft carriers and nukes, while Ethereum is bullshit backed by a bunch of nerds. I don't think Bitcoin will reach the moon in the next couple years for this very reason, and that the U.S. government, which is able to pay its bills through being the world's reserve currency and so indirectly forces other countries to give what really amounts to tribute to the U.S., will crush Bitcoin users if they ever challenge the U.S. dollar, since that's a challenge to the U.S. government's authority. Most of the current crypto craze is based off how we have the cheapest money in history for a variety of reasons, and so people are putting their money into anything else. The fact that everyone realizes NFTs are retarded, yet we still use them since other people think they can make money off them, should be indicative of how this whole current bubble just cannot continue. However, in the long term, I think we'll see crypto become a reserve currency around the world, since it's incredibly rare to see a fiat currency's work over long periods of history.
Governments just inflate them. Very long story short, the reason we have fiat currencies predominant over the world over the last couple decades is due to the massive population growth at the time, but as global populations level off over the next century, we will return to an era of stable currencies as has been normal across most of history. We will revert to a global crypto rather than a mineral currency like gold or silver, since with the near inevitability of asteroid mining, real gold will no longer be rare, and thus we have to create an artificial gold through an international crypto. With all these smaller factors adding up, it's easy to see that the internet will affect the rise and fall of bigger things. The internet allows two divergent trends for empires, those towards greater disunity and those towards unity. The first is the trend that will dominate over time, and the latter will work in the short term. The internet allows easier government control since it allows mass government coordination and surveillance. In short, the internet allows government, if it would like to do so, to create a state far more totalitarian and worse than George Orwell could have imagined with his book 1984. Think of it this way. The government today can turn on any screen in your house and watch you without your permission, and let's just say, is there anything you haven't done in front of a screen? This doesn't even factor in the more technologically savvy parts of the population or people who wear smartwatches where the government can monitor their pulse or future technologies that will learn even more about us that we don't have yet. The historian and futurist Yuval Noah Harari said we're not too far off from a world where your Kindle reads you as much as you read your Kindle. And the saddest thing is that in some deep recess of our psychology, I'm sure some people want this. The cults of the state, like Mao, Hitler, Stalin, shows that the state can try to fill the void of a lack of community and religion, and people will buy it for a time, thinking it feels good that Big Brother government understands and knows everything about you. The record of governments across history is that if they can do something oppressive, at least a couple governments over time will try it. Peoples normally have about as much freedom as they can claw from their governments, whether in the form of rough geographies, strong societies, or well-armed populations. Thus, it seems exceedingly likely at least one government will try to exceed its boundaries in this way, totally controlling its population in a totalitarian manner. I would bet somewhere in Asia, most likely China, but potentially places like Iran, Turkey, or Russia, all of which who have strong authoritarian histories might try this. You also might see a more laid-back nanny state version of this in the European nations. However, what we found from history is that totalitarian states always collapse within a generation. The people in charge are never as smart as they imagine themselves to be, and thus fail powerfully and can't compete with freer societies. Their populations also become resentful and stop obeying once things loosen up. As the opposite of what Machiavelli said, it's often better to be loved than feared, and totalitarianism normally kills societies. Which brings us to the second point, that states will also get weaker due to the internet. This is since the internet in many ways neutralizes one of the state's biggest advantages, its ability to coordinate large groups of people, making it easier for non-state groups to organize and spread information. We see an easy example of this with the Arab Spring, in which non-state rebels were able to basically bring every country in the Arab world to its knees. You have to keep in mind that much of the world that the state is a pretty recent and weak thing. One of the best political science books I've read is Political Order and Its Origins by Francis Fukuyama, which is about how the state originated in different parts of the world through the different various histories and social groups that existed there. However, you can't transpose that history onto every culture and region. They have to create it themselves. There are two areas of the world where this is especially important and the state is unnaturally weak, or Africa and the Middle East. In the Middle East, people tend to be loyal either to their tribe or the broader structure of Islam. The European colonizers, however, divided Arab peoples into small, weak countries that their local elites try to hold on to power from. I have a theory that's going to take forever to explain, but I think a new caliphate will form in the Middle East, probably led by the Turks, as the Islamic world industrializes across the next century. The history of the Muslim world has been dominated by these large caliphate theocratic empires. As ISIS and other various Islamic states show, there's massive transnational interest in a state like this, and the internet will make it much easier to create a state such as this, with Islamists in, say, Yemen, Sudan, and Iraq coordinating. The second being Africa. For reasons I explained in this other video, I think the state, which is fundamentally weak in Africa, will collapse into a warring states period over the next few centuries. However, there are many different routes towards government, and Africa is the main area of the world that will form a civilization in the internet age. In much of Africa and the age of the internet, which needs a lot less infrastructure than almost anything else, is the main tie holding things together. 
It's crazy that most Westerners don't realize how much the internet has percolated across African society. You know, there are hunter-gatherers that hunt with spears and loincloths, and then they'll climb up trees to get cell service to negotiate what town they can best sell their gazelle in. What I would tell you is to expect the unexpected out of Africa. In crypto communities, there's this whole idea that crypto could become a government in of itself, which I think is dumb, except in places like Africa, where the state is so weak that some kind of crypto might be able to form some warlord confederacy. I could see the internet coordinating jihads or crusades across the continent. The internet will permeate the future African civilization in ways it hasn't anywhere else in the world, because Africa will be created through the internet. Over time, I think we'll see even centralized countries get weaker due to the internet. In the US or Europe, for example, grassroots movements would get more powerful, as would various special interests that would coordinate through the internet like civic groups, guilds, ethnic groups, and the religions that would create counterbalances to government power. To speak on this further leads us to the next section. The rise of the internet will result in new waves of religion, another axial age of Buddhas, Confucius's, and Socrates. That may sound grandiose, but just let me explain. I think the key factor is that the internet shows factors similar to how the coin-based mass markets forced the creation of traditional religions like the ones mentioned above. Around 500 BC, you saw big markets come into existence in the same way they do today, with people working for wages and much higher frequency, longer trade routes, and exchanging gold coins. There's a wonderful book that covers this called Debt of 5,000 Year History. The key similarities are that both the internet and the rise of markets totally changed social relations through making communication more direct. Before 500 BC, society was controlled by social relations where, let's say, you know everyone in your village. All the ideologies above invented the golden rule of do unto others as you would like to be done unto yourself, since the world didn't need that, since if people acted like shit, everyone in their village would gang up on them. It's like the internet where, back in the day, people were held back by their senses of decency in face-to-face -face communication. However, with both the rise of mass markets and the internet, it let out the shadow, or the negative parts of our personalities we try to repress. In the ancient world, this resulted in things like mass slavery, sexual predation, giant evil empires, and the like. The market allowed mass oppression, and the big religions were social rebellions by people against their cruelty, looking for some decent compromise. Meanwhile, today we have people being total douchebags online, the internet being used to justify insanity like the social justice movement, mass loneliness, and social collapse. Genocide across Asia, and the thing is we've only really had the internet as a big force in society for the last 25 years, so things will probably get worse, especially if we have major wars and recessions soon, as I believe is possible. Having this many moral issues, for lack of a better term, will force many people to realize the necessity of explicit moral philosophy, not political philosophy as we've seen. I mean, mankind's ability and compulsion towards evil is obvious to anyone who reads an internet comment section. At the start of the Axial Age, you saw various political ideologies like Kautilas, Sun Tzu's, legalism, the Greek might makes right, Roman secular nationalism, and other things that there were political solutions championed by governments to rule the populations, kind of like our secular ideology of the last century like fascism, Nazism, or liberalism. However, over time people realized that politics wasn't the core of the human story, and we need things that deal with human frailty, which will likely happen soon. The way societies deal with collective problems are things where if you can get much better results through cooperation, but it's difficult to get individual people to cooperate because they'll benefit more if they free ride and cheat, is done through religion and societies. Christianity says polygamy is wrong since having three wives is hype, but if more than a certain amount of people do it, it has really bad effects on society, since it creates an angry underclass of men. Alternately, all religions tell people to act fairly since you can benefit personally from not acting fairly, but it kills society. Today we have so many social problems that stem from the internet, whether how to have people socially interact with each other, how to give them meaning, how to make people less mean online, how to deal with screen addiction, social rules around screen time, etc. What I think will happen is that we will see a backlash where screens remain integral parts of people's lives, but we create non-screen social or natural world structures so we don't live our lives on screens and not in the real world. I would put extra emphasis here upon sex and moral conduct based around sex. 
And that's because Darwinistically, the most important thing to structure correctly in a society is sex and the sexual mores around it. And this is something we see in both the axial age and the present world, where opening up both the financial markets and the internet resulted in massive disbalances in sex, where in the ancient world, slave owners would just rape their female slaves and the male slaves wouldn't get any. Well, meanwhile, in the modern world, you see online dating apps resulting in massive disbalances in sex. And if you look at the global party scene as well, the ultra-wealthy are the ones that benefit the most by a truly massive disproportion. I mean, a lot of the quote-unquote most alpha guys I know are polygamous at this point. I know many guys who have four or five girls that they basically just rotate through, and that would have been completely unimaginable even 20 years ago. One of the things I find amusing is that modern feminists say that sexual mores are ways for the patriarchy to control women, and that women should be sexually liberated, and and that's kind of silly for a couple of reasons, but one of the biggest being that whenever societies remove sexual mores and terms of sexual conduct, what ends up happening is that powerful men use it to sexually dominate and use women in large number. And you don't really have a balance between a society that has strong sexual norms or a liberated society because once you get sexual liberation, powerful men use their various tools to control women and women can't organize themselves in a way to resist the patriarchy. Another question of religion and the internet and sex is pornography, where beforehand almost every religion full-handedly denounced pornography, but now we're in a society where basically everyone has watched it, and it's totally accessible for free, and so society will have to find some way of reconciling its previous views with this new truth that's come through the internet. At the same time, the internet allows preaching of digital relations like never before. It would have been very difficult to find a religion in the past century since the main broadcasters of information such as the governments, television networks, and news, alongside others, were status quo and they wouldn't support the foundation of a new religion that they would view as inherently crackpot. However, the internet is almost perfectly structured for this in that it allows groups of people to gather on specific cult leaders, let them form personas talking directly to their fans, pays them to do it, and allows them to talk out whatever they want to. This is similar to how trade made the Axial Age world into a place where it was very easy to create new religions. The prophets would stand in the markets and preach since that was a place where everyone gathered, and that was a place where information would spread across the world, even from your towns as merchants travel. The new trade routes and the roads built by new empires like the Romans, Chinese, and Persians allowed rapid transport that created a new age, an age that will likely be replicated soon. What a faultist, and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Alternately, check out my Pearl, Patreon, or Pillar. As always, thanks so much for watching and have a wonderful day.